Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you remembered that I said last week you would have a substitute teacher today and tomorrow. So hopefully when you came in and saw a different teacher than me, it wasn't too big of a shock for you. Um, hopefully you didn't have any trouble getting into this session with your substitute teacher. If you're watching this from Google Classroom because you weren't able to figure out how to get in or find the link or the password or whatever, um, well, thank you for being resourceful and you found what you're supposed to be doing today. Um, the, the idea is I'm going to record a video right now that will be about, I don't know, 55 minutes long um, with the intention that this will last about an hour long period. And I'm going to try to teach it uh, in video form, similar to how we would just do a regular class. So hopefully it doesn't feel too different than if I was there with you. Uh, so let's look at today's agenda like we normally would at the beginning of a class. So we're starting a new unit today. Uh, oops. Unit six in Desmos, which is um, about solving equations and evaluating expressions that have variables in them. And um, I'm going to be perfectly honest, Desmos is a new curriculum that we're using this year, and I've been looking ahead to see how we're going to approach this topic this year, and it's much different than I've taught it in previous years. And um, I'm curious and excited to try looking at things a little different way and in a different order than I've taught them in previous years and see if it works out better or maybe not as good as we've done it in the past using our, you know, those Engage New York workbooks that you usually use when you're at school. Um, it's a little bit different this time around. So we'll see how it goes. The learning objective is to relate different mathematical situations to tape diagrams and equations. So we're going to jump right into like looking at how different essentially word problems match up to different equations, which I think is a pretty place, strange place to start this topic at, but let's give it a shot. Our weekly classroom norm um, is integrity, uh, especially for today because you're just being taught by the video version of me. Um, it's harder for me to know whether or not you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and whether you're just kind of like blindly copying the things that I say into the Desmos without really thinking about them or trying them. Um, you know, if you do that, that, um, that hurts your learning in the end, right? Um, and same thing for these, we're gonna take some notes today and um, you know, doing the right thing, even if you know I'm not gonna check whether or not you've taken your notes, um, that's integrity. And you wanna have these notes in your book uh, so that you can have them for a quiz or a t test later. Um, we pl I plan on us using the workbook a lot more during this unit than we did in the last year. So the agenda is uh, we're gonna take some notes about vocabulary associated with expressions and equations. Then we'll do lesson two in unit six of Desmos. We're skipping lesson one because I just thought it was a little too weird. <laughs> Um, then we'll take the notes in the workbook related to lesson two. And then in the last few minutes, I'm going to give you a heads up about uh, what we're going to be doing at the end of the week in terms of Pi Day, because we, we know that's March 14th, which is, is it this Saturday or this Sunday? Let's hear what's today. Uh, Thursday 11th, uh, Friday the 12th, so it's Sunday. So, so unfortunately, we won't be in school on Pi Day, but we can celebrate it ahead of time. Before coming to this class, you should have turned in nothing because I didn't assign any homework over the weekend. And your new homework that will hit Google Classroom as soon as uh, the school day is over is um, Desmos Unit 6 Lesson 2 Practice. All right, um, so we're gonna start by taking some notes in your workbook. So please grab your workbook if you haven't already. I'll give you a second. You, you grab your workbook while I set up my document camera here. We're gonna to open to page 53, five, three. Okay, there we go. So page 53, you'll notice page 53 is just mostly a blank page that says unit six on it. We're gonna write some stuff all up in that blank space as sort of like a, uh, a starting point for us in, um, in unit six, just to lay the groundwork for some vocabulary foundation. So um, I'm just kind of waiting a second for people to get their workbooks. I don't want to start without anybody. So um, grab your note, grab your workbooks. I'm going to get started in a few seconds. 
If you're already ready to go, thank you. Let's see, I should start a timer of some type to tell me how long I'll be doing this for. All right. All right, let's get started. So I've actually already written the stuff that I want you to copy. You can probably kind of see it through this paper right here on the top. So I'm going to just sort of reveal some things and ask you to copy them as I go. Let me, let me move some things around on my screen so that it's a little bit easier for me to see what I'm doing. Let's do that. All right, so the first thing I want you to copy is just this big equation that I've written here. And then there's a few little notes that kind of go around it. So the equation is negative 4x plus 2x minus 3y plus 5 equals 10. All right, so I'll give you a, a second to copy that. Write it kind of big like I did too. And then you'll notice here that I wrote the word coefficients. That should be a review term for you. Coefficients are the numbers that are multiplying by the variables in this expression. So for this x, the coefficient is negative four. This arrow is supposed to be pointing at the whole negative four. It kind of looks like it's just pointing at the negative sign, but it's supposed to be pointing at the whole number. And so the coefficient of this x is two. And the coefficient of this y here is negative three, believe it or not. You might think it's three because it says minus three y, but we're always supposed to think of minuses as plus negative. So really the coefficient here is negative three and you really gotta get used to reading this as plus negative three, negative three y I should say. All right, another thing you might see up here is that I pointed out that this five right here is referred to as the constant term. So constant is a math word for things that do not change, right? Five can't change. Five is just always gonna be a five. So it's referred to as a constant. Term, that's another vocab word that we'll get to. That's part of the notes you're supposed to write. So that'll make more sense if you don't know what a term is yet. And then the last little note I wanted to make here, I pointed this arrow right between the three and the Y to point out the fact that there's no operation between the three and the Y, right? It's just three and Y or negative three and Y really, I should say. Um, when you write a number right next to a letter like that, that means to multiply them. So this should be read as negative three times Y. And please, they should always, always, always be written as coefficient first, right? The coefficient is negative three, then the variable. Never this, never Y three for Y times three, because how would you do that with a negative number? How would you write, if you wrote it the wrong way backwards, would you go y negative three? Well, that looks like y minus three to me, doesn't it? And there's actually a bunch of other reasons why I could show you that it's really, really bad to put the letter first and then the number. Um, but that's like the best reason is the fact that if, if the number is negative, it starts to look like minus. Never, never, never. Always coefficient first, then letter, please. I will nitpick you on that all the time. All right, so here's some notes. The first thing that says here is expressions. Let's zoom in on this a little bit, get some focus. So in this expression, sorry, I should say in this equation here, each side of the equal sign is an expression. So four X plus two Y sorry, 4x plus 2x, I missed my negative sign there. I just realized that should say negative 4x plus 2x minus 3y plus five, that's an expression. And 10 all by itself over here is also an expression. So an expression is just any combination of additions, subtractions, multiplications, divisions, other math operations that you haven't even heard yet, uh, learned yet, but without an equal sign, it's like half of an equation. As soon as you put equals and then something else, now you have an equation. Okay, so I, I realize I'm probably going a little fast. So I'm gonna talk about this next piece here and then I'm gonna wait a minute before going down to the bottom half of the page. The next vocab word I need you to know are terms. Terms are parts of the expression separated by a plus or a minus. 
So in this case, the negative 4x is a term, right? Because it's separated from everything else by this plus sign. 2x is a term because it's separated by pluses and minuses on both sides. Negative 3y because it's separated by a plus on both sides, right? Like we're supposed to imagine there's an invisible plus there. Uh, five is its own term. And in this case, it's the constant term. It gets its own special name because it doesn't have a variable in it. It's just a number. Um, and then 10 is also a term kind of by itself in its own expression. Um, while you're writing that, I'd like you to take notice of the fact that I wrote this expression on this side of the equation with the variable terms, negative 4x, 2x, and negative 3y in alphabetical order x terms first, then the y term. And then the constant term always comes last. It's not incorrect if you don't do it that way, but that's considered the proper way to do it. Okay, I'm gonna wait. In case you're still writing and trying to catch up to where I'm at, let's just hold off for a second. I'm gonna move forward a little bit. So I'm gonna go down toward the bottom of the page where I have just two more things that I want you to um, be aware of at this time. There's like a lot more things really I wish I could put on here and give to you right now, but I don't wanna give you too much. So I feel like these are the most important ones. I need you to know this idea of like terms. In our equation that we've written up here at the top, negative four X and two X are considered like terms Think of like as the word alike, just with the A taken out. And they're like terms because they have the same variable. So negative 4x and 2x, they both have an x in. 2x and negative 3y would not be considered like terms. One has an x, one has a y. There are certain things you can do with like terms that you can't do with unlike terms. And so um, it's a really important concept to know what those are. No, and we'll get into what you can do and what you can't do with them later. Like, I just need you to know the words now. All right, and then the last one, variable. Most people know this one. You probably know this. It's the letters that can represent any number. Sometimes there's situations where variables can only represent certain numbers, but usually they represent any number. So in this case, X and Y are variables. And I wanna point out why they're called variables. It's very able, right? V-A-R-Y, the word very means to change, changeable. It's mean, it means something that can change. So in these expressions or equations, you kind of have these two things. You have variables that are letters that can change, they can be any number. And then you have constants like the five in this equation. It's constant, it doesn't change, it's just a five. All right, um, the last thing I wanna say, and I'll probably repeat this multiple times as we go through this unit about equations. I want to help you sort of elevate the way that you think about equations in math. Many students, I mean, many adults, many humans in general, have a way of thinking about math equations as a question and an answer or a problem and an answer. Many people would look at this equation and say, okay, um, the stuff on the left here, the 4x, the 2x, the negative 3y, the plus 5, that's sort of like a question or a problem that needs solving. And the answer over here is 10. This stuff, when you do math to it, gets you 10. I want you to try not to think of equations in that way. I want you to think of equations as a statement of equality, a statement of sameness. This equal sign here can be read as the words, is the same number as. What we're saying is these things over here are the same number as 10. Right? You've probably seen this idea of a scale when you're talking about equations and they go up and down and you wanna keep them equal. That's the way to think of equations. This has the same weight as this, not question and answer. 
And we're going to talk more and more deep into that as we go, because I think it's a really important conceptual thing for you to understand about equations. All right, we're going to come back to this workbook after we do Desmos lesson two. We're going to write the lesson two notes. So you can keep this aside, put it away, whatever you want to do with it. Um, but know that we're going to come back to it in I don't know, 40 minutes or whenever we're toward the end of this class period. How, uh, how long are we into this now? So I, I didn't start a timer right at the beginning of this video like I should have. But I think we're a little over 15 minutes into class. So we got plenty of time to work in Desmos lesson two. So let's see here. Let me go back to my screen share. We make this bigger. And the activity you're looking for is called smudged receipts. It should be somewhere toward the top of your activities list. I probably had to assign multiple things. I haven't assigned them now. As you can tell, as I'm recording this now late in the evening on Thursday ahead of Monday, um, I haven't assigned anything yet. But I'm going to need to assign this and your homework in your Desmos account before um, I go this weekend. So, so you're gonna have multiple things assigned there. And I'm not there to give you a link right now. I am not there <laughs> to provide you with a link in the chat. Um, so you have to find this one for yourself. You have to go to student.desmos.com, log in with Google or whatever, how, how you normally do it. And it will take you to your, to your activities list and then just find the one called smudged receipts. Maybe I'll put a, a link to this in the Google Classroom um, like assignment that has this video in it. Yeah, I will do that. So if you really, really can't find this, look to see if there's a link on Google Classroom where you found this video, if you're watching it on your own, not just like the substitutes playing it. Um, that's the best I can do for you. But yeah, find this lesson called Smudged Receipts in your Desmos account. I'm just kind of waiting, giving people time. I know it takes people some a little bit of time to do this sometimes. I'm just being patient. If you if you already opened it and you got there and you're ready to go, then that's great. Maybe do the, do the warm up. Um, the way we're going to do this is um, we're only going to go through lessons or I mean um, screens one through nine. I'm going to save ten and eleven for a different activity, a different time. Um, so I'm kind of kind of expect everybody to get through screen nine. The way we're going to do it is I'm going to ask you to spend a couple minutes on a slide and then I'll explain it. And then I'm going to say, move on to the next slide. And I'm going to let you look at it for a couple minutes, figure it out on your own. And then I'm going to explain it. And um, let's see, we're supposed to do nine slides. We have probably a little less than 40 minutes left in this class. So, but I want to take notes and show you about Pi Day. So we should probably only spend, I don't know, 30 some odd minutes in this. So probably be like, I'll give you two minutes to try a slide and then I'll just take about two minutes to explain it. All right, so hopefully you're in it by now. And so go ahead and look at um, the warm up slide and see if you can uh, figure it out on your own. And then I'll tell you my thoughts in about, I don't know, a minute and a half or so.
Okay, so every time uh, I start talking and like you've had your time to kind of look at a slide and think about it yourself, I want you to switch back either to the video screen where you have this video playing or over to the Zoom screen if the you're watching the substitute play the video in the Zoom class. Um, I'm going to be saying and showing some things that maybe you thought of, maybe you didn't. And then I'm gonna need you to go move to know going forward. So even if you like kind of figured out an answer to a question, you did it your way or whatever, um, I'm probably gonna be showing things that I'm gonna expect you to know moving forward into our next class. So I'm holding you responsible for actually watching and paying attention to these parts when I'm talking. That's where the integrity of today's class is gonna come into play, okay? So I see that I have this tape diagram here and from here to here, it's supposed to represent some total, which is 28. And it looks like it's being broken up into four pieces, right? One, two, three, four. And so if the total is 28, I want to be able to split that into four equal parts. And that's gonna equal each one of these sections on the tape diagram. So if this section was seven, and 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 I added those pieces up, that would equal 28. So each one of these sections here is seven. Maybe I should have picked a different color than this blue. It looks too much like the blue or the activity screen here. Okay, so what does that mean that A and B can equal? Well, it turns out that this is an equation. So let me write this in the form of an equation actually. So what you have here is all these segments of this tape diagram. So A plus B one time, A plus B two times, A plus B three times, and A plus B four times, those are all supposed to add up and equal 28. This is the equation that goes with this tape diagram. Notice I said A plus B four times. In other words, four times A plus B. So this equation could also be written as four times A plus B in parentheses, right? It's, just, it's this segment of A plus B and you're multiplying it by four. That equals 28. Well, as long as each segment equals seven and this stuff inside the parentheses here equals seven, well, then we're gonna have four times seven equals 28, which is a true equation. That's what we want. We always want our equations to be true. Equations can be false and that's usually a bad thing. So, well, what if A was four and B was three? Then four plus three equals seven, great. What if A was five and B was two? Five plus two equals seven. No, no, it would work, right? You'd have five plus two plus five plus two plus five plus two plus five plus two, that equals 28. What if A was negative 100 and B was 107? When you add those two things up, you get seven. That would work as well. This equation is an equation that has an infinite number of solutions. The solution itself is an infinity. What I'm saying is that there's an infinite number of ways you can pick numbers for the letters A and B and the equation comes out true. So as long as you picked any numbers for A and B that when you add them, you get seven, you made the equation true and you have good numbers for your variables, all right? Let's move on to the next slide. So I want you to go into slide two, look at this receipt, play with this dot movable thing here. See if you can figure out everything there is to know about this slide and I'm gonna explain it in a little less than two minutes.
Okay, so um, hopefully you played with the slider dot thing here. No, let me wait a second. Um, if you're looking at your own Desmo screen, I want you to take a time out, watch my explanation for about a minute and a half, and then move on to, to work on slide three or if you moved ahead, whatever slide. But I want you paying attention when it's my turn to talk. Um, so hopefully you move this slider thing back and forth a little bit. And you saw that as x changes, the value for x, I should say, um, everything sort of has to change with it, right? Well, almost everything. The, um, the price of the pasta is a constant. It doesn't change. So it stayed 6. But what does change is the price of the cheese, because that's what x is representing in this um, equation here. And then the total price has to change, right? And so this kind of goes back to my thing I was saying about equations representing a statement of sameness. As one side of this equation increases, which would be one side of the equation that says 3 plus 3 plus x, that's the tape diagram part of this equation. Well, in this case, it equals 10 because that's the, the total length here. But if I decrease, uh, I didn't mean to do that. If I decrease the value for x, come on now, let me click on it. Then the other side of the equation, which used to be 10 and is now 8.5, must decrease with it. So this, this idea of sameness, one goes up, the other one has to go up with it. The other one goes down, one goes down, the other one has to go down with it. In order to maintain a true equation, if you don't, if you don't raise or lower things equally, then you wind up with an untrue equation. All right, so um, in this case, the threes represent the price of the pasta. I think that one's pretty clear. I think you were probably able to figure that one out. But then the x, well, that's going to represent the price of the cheese. And then the total length of the diagram represents the total price, um, I guess, on the receipt would be a way to say it. I don't know if I spelled that right. It's I before E, except after all the time, and that's such a stupid rule. And I don't know, is it, is it receipt? No, that looks wrong. Oh, it's correct to me. So I had it right the first time. All right, so let's go ahead and move forward into slide three. And um, you take a look at it for a couple minutes and then I'll share my thoughts on it. Okay, please go ahead and switch back to my screen and um, 
much what I, what I think about this one. So hopefully the first thing you did was grab the slider dot here and make the tape diagram long enough so that it matches the total length, right? Because that represents the total of the bill. And in this case, the total of the bill can't change. And so it's our responsibility to make the tape diagram so that the X's are equal with the nine. They make the same value. Uh, as soon as we have a tape diagram that is too short or too long, we've essentially created an untrue equation. Another thing I want you to notice is that as you move the slider left and right, the size of the segments that are contained by one singular X, they have to stay exactly the same. Because when you're working in an equation or an expression, if you have an X over here and an X over here in the same equation, they have to stand for the same number. This, this X isn't allowed to be a different number than this X. If you, if you need variables that can stand for different numbers in the same equation, then you gotta use a different letter. This one's gotta be X and this one's gotta be Y or whatever. But X and X in the same equation, that's why they stayed the same, si same size as you moved them. They have to be the same. So, so I've matched the, the length of the tape diagram to the nine here. And so it's showing me that X is 3.5. So this is Desmos' way of showing you that, okay, X is 3.5, but what does X represent? We have to figure that out first. You probably already figured out that it represents the price of a cantaloupe. Well, what we need to do is define our variable. Uh, usually somewhere on the side or above, when you're working with variables, you write what the variable literally stands for. This is called defining your variable. So over here, I'm gonna write X colon, or you can use X equals, but both of those are okay. Uh, price of cantaloupe. Now there's, there's not really anywhere for you to do this on your screen right now, but eventually we're gonna be doing this stuff on whiteboards and we're gonna do, be doing this stuff on paper. And I'm gonna need you to be defining your variables when we do this stuff. Um, otherwise your math is sort of meaningless. Like even for someone like me who's studied math for years and years, if I open a math book or something like that and there's a bunch of equations with variables in them and there's nothing like on the side or somewhere in the text telling me what the variables stand for, then it becomes meaningless gibberish. I can't, I can't read it and under, understand it. Um, so it's a really important thing. It feels like a nitpicky detail, but it's not. Also notice I wrote that X is the price of the cantaloupe. I was not lady, lazy and wrote just X is cantaloupe because if you just write X is cantaloupe, well, what, what do you mean? The number of cantaloupes, like one cantaloupe, two cantaloupe? No, we're not talking about numbers of cantaloupe. We're talking about the price of the cantaloupe. So we gotta be specific. Okay, so it looks like based on this, the price of each cantaloupe is going to be three dollars and fifty cents and so two times three dollars and fifty cents would be seven if you add the two dollars from the honeydew and the seven dollars from the cantaloupe you get the nine dollar total so it sounds like we have found a correct solution for this equation we would say that x equals three dollars and fifty cents this is called a solution when you're talking about solving an equation or finding a solution, those two things mean the same thing. What you're saying is you want to find the number that when you put it in for X, it makes the equation true, right? If we substitute the word, or sorry, the number $3.50 for this X, then we get a true equation, $2 plus $3.50 plus $3.50 equals $9. So I want you to look at a couple different ways you could have solved this without Desmos just like giving you the number as you stretch the, um, the, uh, the tape diagram. Because that's essentially our ultimate goal for this unit is that I can give you like a word problem. You can look at it, define a variable, the unknown thing in the equation I, or in the word problem. I know what that is. I'm gonna make a variable for it and I'm gonna define it. Then I'm gonna set up an equation with variables and algebra in it. And I'm gonna solve it using a step-by-step -step process that we have to learn. And I'm gonna find the solution and I'm gonna show that that solution's correct. That whole long big process I just described, that's what I'm expecting you to be able to do at the end of this whole thing. Let's look at how you could have done that. Well, let me take a couple of these things here off the screen.
So let's say we didn't, we couldn't see this 3.5 here. Like we were just like, okay, we got a two, an X, an X, and a nine. Well, we know that the two is part of the diagram, right? And we could like take that away. Let's get rid of the two. But anything we do to one side of the equation, like if, we're, if one part goes up or down, we got to do the same thing to the other part. And so let's take the two off of this nine as well. So nine minus two equals seven. So we have a seven up here now. We know that this X and this X have to combine to make seven. Well, if you just make like seven little dots here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and let's try to like spread them out into the two boxes with X's in them. I'm hesitant to call them X boxes because they have X's in them, but okay. We're, we'll put them in the X boxes. Well, one can go here, here, and here, right? Three, and three can go in this box. And we have this one left over, right? Well, the only thing we can do is sort of split it in two. So it's fair because the X's have to be equal to each other. So you put, half of one in here and half of one in here. All right, I'm gonna put like a little half mark, little half thing here. <clears throat> and you wind up with three and a half for each X or $3.50. So that's sort of a visual way of looking at it. Now let's look at the proper way it's supposed to be done. And this is, this is actually one of those things where you have to learn this method. You have to be able to write what I'm about to write the same way I'm gonna write it when the time comes, because this is the way that everyone does it. And doing it this way is an actual skill that you have to learn. You have, um, it's not one of those things where like, you can kind of do it your own way, or it's like, oh, there's multiple ways to show my work. Nah, you kind of have to do it this way eventually. So the equation was um, two plus X plus X equals nine. And remember the first thing I did was like kind of scratch out this two to just get rid of it. But then I had to make the tape diagram shorter by two to make it seven. Well, the way you do that mathematically is, okay, I'm gonna take two away from one side of the equation, but to keep it equal, I'm gonna also take two away from this side of the equation. Well, two minus two, they create a zero. Mathematicians like to say they cancel each other out. So I'll just cross them out. Really it's zero, but I'll cross them out. And I have X plus X equals seven. Nine minus two equals seven. So I'm doing the same process I did over here by like crossing out a tape diagram and drawing dots and stuff, but I'm showing you the proper way it's meant to be done. Okay, so now I have X plus X equals seven. X and X are like terms. They're the same variable. They can be combined. The most important thing we can do with them is add them together. We can add X plus X and what we get is two X. This means two times X, right? Number next to letter, coefficient next to letter. Um, just think of it as like if X were five and you added five plus five, that's 10, but that's also the same thing as two times five, right? So adding a number to itself twice is just the same as multiplying it by two. It doesn't matter if it's an actual number or letter, it's the same property. And so now we have this equation that says two times this unknown number equals seven. We work backwards from that, right? Inverse operations. Inverse operations are now our best friends. We have to realize that any operation can be undone with its inverse operation. We see multiplication, we do division. We see division, we do multiplication. We see addition, we do subtraction. We see subtraction, we do addition. So I'm going to divide this side by two to undo that two times, because I just want to see what x equals. I don't care what two x equals. But if I divide one side of the equation by two, I got to divide the other side of the equation by two, keeping things balanced, equal, same. And what I'm left with on this side is x just by itself, no longer multiplied by two, and seven divided by two, 350, just like we got doing the dots and the tape diagram and stuff. But this is the ultimate goal here. And then at the end, we'd write a sentence. that says, the price of the cantaloupe is $3.50 each. But I'll spare you that for now. All right, let's move on to slide number four. You look at it for a couple minutes and then it's my turn to talk.
Okay, switch back to the video screen, please. So the idea here is to match these tape diagrams, which really represent equations, to the smudged receipts. And I think I'll look at this one first. When I look at this card, the one that I'm kind of wiggling around, I see that it has something for $3.70, 3.7, $3.70. And three unknown priced things, right? Three variables. And it's all supposed to add up to $13. I think that matches this over here with the pineapple and the beans. See how, well, I wanted the whole thing to move. This has three unknown things in the, um, in the receipt. So those are the three X's. It has one thing for $3.70, so the one three seventy and the whole thing costs $13. Next, let's look at this one. I gotta find a tape diagram where there's four unknown price things, nothing else, and the whole thing's supposed to add up to $13. I think that's this one down here, right? Four unknown price things, total $13. And then the last one for the chips and the salsa, I need a card that has three things that cost $4 each, and one unknown thing costing a total of $13. And I think that's this one here. So this one is a trick one. It does not match with any of these because there would have to be a card where something on it costs $3. There isn't. These two have three things in them, right? But not a price of $3. I wanna solve one of these for you just so you can see it done again. Um, I'm gonna solve how about this one? This says 4x, right? x plus x plus x plus x is the same as 4 times x, otherwise known as 4x, equals 13. This is what's known as a one-step equation because it only requires one step to solve. I'm going to use an inverse operation. This says 4 times x. So when I see multiplication in an equation, I think inverse operation, I'm going to use division to solve. I'm going to divide both sides by four. Notice I'm writing one of these on one side of the equal sign and the other one on the other side of the equal sign, right? It's both sides of the equal sign is where I need to work. Well, four times X and then divided by four, they undo each other. I'm left with just X, that's always my goal. This is called isolating the variable, getting the variable by itself, isolated. Equals 13 divided by four, hmm. Well, 12 divided by four would be three. Then I just need to do one divided by four, which is 0.25. You could also think of this in terms of those dots, right? I could draw 13 dots, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And well, let's see here. These, oh, I almost confused myself for a second there. These four, sorry, these three dots could go in this box. These three dots could go in this box. These three dots could go in this box. These three dots could go in this last box. And then you have this one dot left over that has to be split evenly across the other, the four boxes. That's where the 0.25 comes in. All right, uh, go ahead and work on the next slide. We're on slide five. Ah, I forgot that that was the very next slide. So I pretty much just showed you <laughs> exactly how to do this one. I thought I was trying to pick the one that wasn't the next slide and I, I messed it up. So we already have the answer to this one. Um, you take 4x equals 13, divide it by four to work backwards from it, and you get that the, uh, the juice is 3.25. You know what I forgot to do on that last one though? I forgot to define my variable. x equals price of juice. And I'm just gonna show you one last time. I wrote this equation out as 4x equals 13. And so I wanted to undo the multiplication. I divide both sides by four. So I'm left with just X on this one side 
and $3.25. This is my solution. All right, so now how about you just move on to screen six? Oh, because I think that's going to ask you to do essentially this again, but for one of the other ones. Oh, I forgot to click try it. What happens when you click try? Oh, cool. Yep, it matched the um, the tape diagram to the thing, right? All right, so you try it. See if you can figure out how much the beans cost in this one. Okay, come on back to my screen. Let's see if we can solve this. So the equation represented by this tape diagram here is 3.7x or $3.70 plus x plus x plus x, aka 3x equals 13. And so if I were to take this 3.7 part off the tape diagram, then I would have to take 3.7 off of the total length here too, right? 13 minus 3.7 is 9.3. And so really it just becomes a matter of splitting 9.3 evenly into three boxes, which should be done with a division, right? It's going to wind up being 3.1 in this box, 3.1 in this box, and 3.1 in this box, right? Splitting it evenly. Well, those steps that I just described wind up being the same steps you wind up doing when actually solving the equation, right? The first thing I'm going to do is take away 370 from both sides of the equation, one over on the left and one over on the right. And so this part just kind of cancels out, right? 370 minus 370 makes a zero. I still have my 3x here though, right? I got to be careful to keep that. I got to bring my equal sign straight down, don't lose it. 13 minus 370 is $9.30, just like I had over here. And then in the tape diagram, I wanted to split that $9.30 evenly into three X boxes. Well, I'm going to do the same thing here. I want to split this $9.30 up equally into three parts. So I divide by three. I'm using a fraction bar. That also means division, right? It's the same as using a division sign. And so I have to divide this side by three as well. Well, three X divided by three equals just X. So I've isolated my variable. And 930 divided by three is 310. So that's my solution. And I would write something like each apple costs $3.10. All right, um, if you want to, please go ahead and finish um, slides uh, seven, seven and eight when you have time. Um, but that's all the time we're gonna have during, um, during this session, because I think we have just enough time to take some quick notes. And then I wanna show you what's going on in class um, later this week. So grab your, grab your workbook again, and let's go to page 50, 58. So let me switch over to that. So this is page 58. Is it working? Yeah, there we go. Okay.
And so the first thing it asks us is, which of these tape diagrams represents the receipt? Well, this one has three sections of some unknown thing, Y, plus $2.25. So in this tape diagram, there's three 225s being added up, right? One, two, three. That to me doesn't make sense when I only have one bread on the receipt that costs $2.25. Whereas when I look at diagram B, I have three unknown things represented by Y and one singular 225 that goes with this. So um, I would circle this diagram and I'm gonna define my variable. Y equals uh, dollar sign of bread, shorthand, price of bread, whatever. And I'm gonna point out that this right here, the 225 is the, oops, no, look, I messed up. The, the variable is the cost of the apples, not the bread, oof. This is the cost of the bread. And so with the tape diagram, we wanna take away this 225 so we can see what just the, the length of just the variable part is, right? And so let's, let's solve it in steps this time. I'm gonna do six minus 225. This is not the proper way to write this stuff, but I'm just trying to show you a different way. This equals 375. And so that would mean that this part right here is 375. And so if we can take the 375 and just split it evenly into each one of these Y boxes, we know how big of a chunk Y represents on the tape diagram. Well, 375 divided by three equals $1.25. And so that means that the apples cost $1.25 and so when you buy three of them, that's 375. That's why we got 375 in the previous step. And when you add those two things up, you get $6. Okay, I'd like you to copy the proper way of writing this equation and solving it also here in the side though. So the way this should look is define your variable, y equals cost of apples, if you use a variable in an equation and you don't define the variable, then that equation is basically meaningless. Okay, and then let's base it straight off this, this tape diagram here. We have three y's. Notice the three goes in front of the y, not y3, plus 225. Notice I left the constant term for the last piece of this expression. I didn't go 225 plus three y equals six. Now I'm going to uh, subtract the 225, just like I did here, right? But when I do it from one side of the equation, I have to do it from the other side. I really, really need you copying this exactly the way I'm writing it, because this is the proper way that I need you to be aware of how to do it this way. And so these two things make zero. 225 minus 225 make zero. I still have my three Y that comes straight down my equal sign, and six minus 225 is 375. Now, just like I did here, I'm gonna divide by three to split that 375 equally into each Y, but I have to do it to both sides of the equal sign to keep it fair, and what I get is Y equals $1.25. And so I write an answer, oh, always box your solution, apples cost, $3.75. All right, um, if I've been timing this correctly, I believe there's maybe like just one or two minutes left in class. So um, I just wanna tell you what's going on in class on Thursday, Friday, and then it should be, uh, we should be just about done. So Pi Week is Sunday, right? Or Pi Day, I mean. And I know that Pi Day got super ruined for you guys last year because COVID started like what would have been like the Pi Day celebration. And Pi Day, is, Pi, Day Pi Week supposed to be a big deal at Willard. And this is two years in a row where you guys have gotten kind of ripped off out of that for lack of a better term. And so we're trying to make it at least somewhat of a halfway replacement for Pi Week. 
Um, and so you have an opportunity to win a pie hand delivered by a math teacher um, by doing a lot of the similar activities we usually do for Pi Week and then submitting um, proof of those activities to a Google form that will go to Mr. Mac. Mr. Mac's a big Pi Week, Pi Day guy. Um, and then he's gonna put the, the names of the people who submit those things into the Google uh, form or Google Doc or whatever it is um, into like a raffle to maybe win a pie. And so we'll spend some time doing this stuff on Thursday and Friday. We're gonna just do some circle math and talk about circles and stuff. But there's also gonna be a short period of time in class where you could work on some of the different activities like saying your digits, um, playing pie music on, the, on an instrument, um, writing pie poetry, making some pie art either by hand or on a Google slide. Uh, you can watch the Willard Pie videos. Um, you can uh, make your own whatever pie thing you want, be creative, do some IXL pie. Um, oh, make some pie clothes. You might've done that last year. If you have that, you can bring it to show it to people, maybe do more of it, draw more on it or something. Um, and so I just want to give you a heads up that we'll do some of these things in class. So if you have stuff that you want to have for that, you can have it available and, um, and just be thinking about maybe things you could submit to that Google form. So um, maybe you want to buy. All right. Um, I'll see you later this week. This week.